The Vietnam War defined a generation. It changed the lives of people who fought in it, those who fought against it, and the families of both. Funding for Prairie Memories, The Vietnam War Years is provided by the following and by the members of Prairie Public. My name is Ron Wendells. I'm uh, from New York Mills, Minnesota. Went to Vietnam after uh, infantry training and was there from middle of August 1968. Was wounded in action uh, in a firefight on January 4th, 1969. I was walking, uh, it was getting later in the day, uh, in a line going in again, we were at a patrol, there was different lines of patrols, and I was about the fourth man back, I suppose, and, and all of a sudden uh, my rifle dropped. I got, it took me a moment to realize I got the I look at that as the first round, otherwise they never would have got me. I would have been down on the ground. Jumped in the water and uh, I was a ammo bearer for my friend and machine gun and he, I, after a while I just held on to his shoulder and got back to a area of safety and uh, I think it was about four or five of us shot there but no one was killed, which is amazing. Got back there in the dock from Duluth, wish I could remember his name, but he gave me some morphine and I held my arm like this, I guess, for pain and uh, waited for the dust off. It was getting dark, so what they do uh, at that time was they form a small perimeter of, uh, I suppose, about a hundred feet in diameter in an opening so a helicopter can come in and land, a dust-off helicopter, and uh, they started firing out so he could land, but it was getting dark and he started coming down and he took off again before he got to the ground. But they, he called, uh, the captain called back and said it was our own fire shooting out. So he came back in and uh, a few of them were helped on, I think it was four or five of us. And I, I crawled on. I think I had one, you know, somehow I crawled on there. And as soon as uh, I was in the air, it was dark. I said, I got her made. I'm going to live now. But that was the end, you know, of my Vietnam. Well, my name is James M. Moon. Everybody calls me Jim, naturally. Um, I live in about 10 miles from Rapid City now. Uh, I went to Vietnam and, well, I arrived there on April Fool's Day of 1968, left the first part of May, end of April of 69. When I left, I was a sergeant, if I remember right. I airman first class most of the time I was there. I was a weapons mechanic, primarily loading ammo and hanging bombs and rockets. That's uh, I was assigned to the 604th uh, Special Operations Squadron uh, at Benoit that was uh, an A-37 squadron. Uh, A-37s were developed as trainers, but they sent them to Nam because they could stay in the air for about three hours and you could hang quite a bit of ordnance on them, so they were ground support aircraft primarily. They would either be out going out on a particular mission or they would just be up in the air in case something happened. And that way they'd be on, on locate, you know, close to where they were needed. Uh, we were mortared, we were rocketed. Uh, rockets, they were pretty inaccurate, at least the rockets were. Though they, uh, I think they were, knew what they were aiming at better than sometimes we thought they were. Uh, it wasn't every day or anything like that. It, it would be sporadic. If the siren went off, you rolled out of your bunk and usually you just slid under the bunk. There were bunkers, but you had to run outside to get the bunker. And by the time you'd get there, it'd be over with. 
couple of times when I happen to be uh, coming home on leave, you know, after, after I'd left Vietnam, uh, traveling in uniform, you know, people hollered at me a couple of times, you know, this kind of thing. But that was like in uh, uh, Frisco or LA or Denver. Once you got into places like North Dakota and South Dakota, Nebraska, you didn't have, you didn't put up with that because people aren't that way in this part of the country. My name is Carol Two Eagle, and I'm from Standing Rock. I was in college during the Vietnam War. And I was at the University of Wisconsin. And I had earned one degree and I was working on another in chemistry, both of them. And I was married. And um, one night he was going to go to his lab and work on his project towards his PhD. And I had a premonition. And I told him I didn't want him to go because if he went, the premonition was that he would be dead. And of course he blew it off. And the premonition was so strong I pitched a fit. So he stayed home. <laughs> and um, about 10.30, quarter to 11, there was a boom. We were at least four miles from the university and it wasn't a rumble, it was like a shockwave. The whole house jumped, the dogs got upset. And um, he grabbed the television and turned it on and there was this very lost looking broadcaster standing there and he said, we just had a report that Sterling Hall has been bombed. And there's a possibility that there's dead bodies up there. And that's all we know. Sterling Hall is a physics department hall and um, the contention by the trashers those were the protesters who went out of their way to damage physical plant everywhere, was that all math and physics was funded by the U.S. military, and that wasn't true. And that was the night that they parked a van full of nitrogen fertilizer soaked with diesel fuel. Three people did it, and they ran a long fuse, and they took off. It was an old box van. They parked it right next to where Robert's lab was, and the man who died was his lab partner. Bill Rose, and um, I was in Georgetown, Minnesota, and uh, claim I was a draft dodger. I joined the Marine Corps to get out of the draft. <laughs> it was a bunch of kids, 18 to 24, with guns and explosives, on a camping trip, and there were some bad days. Bravo had walked into an ambush, and we went to help them out. And when we were evacuating, they were shooting at the helicopter and missed and dropped an 82 mortar in the hole that I was hiding in. They pulled me out of the hole. Four guys carried me up to the helicopter. Those guys that came in on that helicopter, it was not a friendly place and they still came in. Um, got to Quain Tree, and Corman came up to do the triage. Well, they had put me back in the corner. I was green tagged at the time, and at that time, you, two different people got green tags, either uh, not a serious wound or don't waste your time, and I was green tagged. Then in 1994, I was at a trauma conference, and the individual giving the presentation said, use your ancillary personnel. Your technicians have been with you for a long time. They know a lot more than you give you credit for. And they clicked a slide up on the screen, and he said, the guys operating on this Marine are Navy corpsmen with 16 weeks of medical training. And they had the guy cut top to bottom, and everything was pulled out, and it was me. Uh, so, the guys I served with, those men that carried me to the chopper, that helicopter crew that, that took me back to Queen Tree, the two corpsmen that, that took it upon themselves to attempt surgery when the surgeon said, I have too many other casualties I can save. 
And uh, those are the people I served with. My name is Ann Darby, and I live in Moorhead, Minnesota. And what I'd like to talk about today is uh, a person that I had a relationship with um, who did go to Vietnam from in 1967 to 1968. He was an Italian from Connecticut originally, and so he had a funny sense of humor and he was real, you know, talky. <laughs> he wrote a lot of letters and so did I. In one paragraph it might say, don't worry about me, in the next paragraph there would be this rather lengthy description of what happened. This was written on the 3rd of March, 1967. First off, I don't want you to worry about me. The chances of me getting hurt here are less likely than in Grand Forks. <laughs> Two paragraphs down, he writes, we had a lot of excitement last night when I was at work. A Navy EGA two-seater crashed broadside into a C-141 cargo personnel transport plane. Five guys got killed and it was all because of some dope in the control tower told the EGA it was okay to land and the C-141 was right in the middle of the runway. The crash itself was about 200 yards from my room. That was pretty scary, but when the bombs and the rockets from the EGA started to blow was when the fun started. This is the 13th of March. I was issued my field equipment today. Somehow I don't believe I am in the Air Force. They gave me a mess kit, but they were out of knives, forks, and spoons, and a cup. I guess I will drink from my canteen and use my fingers for the rest. I got the feeling we have more people here than we have equipment. March 15th. Well, I found out a little more about myself last night. We had another mortar attack. They visited us about 2 a.m. and it lasted till 3.30 a.m. At first I was scared stiff, but surprisingly enough, when I knew what was happening, I acted quite calmly. I was still scared, but I didn't panic. And then he says, I'm getting tired of people I don't even know trying to kill me. I'm Merrill Pepcorn, living in Fargo, North Dakota. We just started learning about the Vietnam War when I was in high school, and things were really kind of starting to heat up, but we really didn't pay much attention to it, really, as high school kids, until it came to around that time to graduate, and people started talking about your, your number your draft number, your lottery number. And then people started paying more attention. I didn't have to pay particularly close attention to that because between my junior and senior years, and I would have been 17 years old at the time, I got run over by a car. Uh, so that automatically excluded me from the draft and from service in Vietnam. Had I even wanted to serve in Vietnam, uh, I wouldn't have been accepted. Of course, there was a student deferment too, so everybody enrolled in college. Even if you weren't ready, you enrolled. And, and uh, my two buddies enrolled at NDSU, and of course, they weren't, they weren't uh, going to classes and weren't getting grades. So then, boom, you're gonna be flunking out of school. Then you have a choice of getting drafted or enlisting. And these two fellows both enlisted. Uh, one of those fellows, Gary Nielsen is his name. Uh, well, he came back and just kind of resumed his life, and Gary wound up contracting an Agent Orange-related cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, which is really dangerous and, and uh, almost always fatal in the relative short term. And so Gary died in 2005. It was a really, really tough way to, to die, and it was uh, definitely hooked to his exposure to Agent Orange, which was uh, a defoliant used in the jungle in Vietnam. They sprayed Agent Orange across the trees and that defoliated them. And then they were supposed to be able to see the Viet Cong and we'd, we'd win the war. Well, it didn't quite work that way. And a lot of folks my age went to Vietnam and didn't come back. My name is Bill Anderson. I live at Rutland, North Dakota. 
I served in the United States Marine Corps from 1968 through 1971. I was in Vietnam during the year 1970. I did not object to people objecting to the war. There could not be any group of people who wanted that war to end any more than the young men who were over there fighting it. At times, I mean, it, it did seem that, that it was an exercise in futility because uh, the North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, just kept on coming. You could clear them out of an area and then you'd move out and they'd move back in. So what I did object to was overt aid to the North Vietnamese or to the Viet Cong. On one occasion, we did capture two people who were uh, transporting supplies for a North Vietnamese Army unit that was uh, in the area in which uh, we were operating. We captured these people and some of the supplies were, were medical supplies. And, uh, and they had uh, in them uh, uh, notes that said uh, compliments of Students for a Democratic Society, the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, I did take offense to that. Uh, and I thought that that, uh, that kind of activity crossed the line. Uh, it, uh, it was providing aid and comfort to our enemies. My name is Bill Wilbur. I live uh, just east of Newtown, North Dakota. I was in the U.S. Navy in submarines uh, years uh, 67 through 71 went on several patrols uh, into the North Atlantic. Basically, they were watching the Russians coming out of their northern ports. Before that, when I was in electronics tech school on Treasure Island in San Francisco Bay, um, just south of Alcatraz. Uh, the base there was used for several things, like many Navy bases, but it was a demarcation place or point, uh, we call it, or they call it, the Navy call it transient. So there were transient barracks there. So uh, it was uh, one of the major places for Marines to disembark from the Marines. So some of them um, had been in Vietnam the day before, or a couple days before. Um, we ate in the same cafeteria that they ate in. So uh, most or quite a few of my Vietnam stories are hearing uh, these Marines talk. I didn't know this guy that told the story, but he was one of the Marines in the table next to me. and. Uh, He's walking through this Viet Cong village, known to be Viet Cong village. His good buddy is 15, 20 feet in front of him. And uh, from this hut to his left uh, comes this eight, 10 year old boy running out, okay? And he has an AK-47. And he spots this guy's buddy first, okay? And he swings around, okay? I ask the question, you have one second to decide what to do. What is it? What are you gonna do? He didn't finish the story, but he said his buddy came back alive. Some of these same Marines talk about their trip into San Francisco and hold up their arm and say, yeah, that's spit right there. And I say, why is this happening? I figured out a couple years later when I came back from one of those Northern trips in the submarine. I hadn't seen people, American soldiers, brought back in body bags in a while. And I hadn't heard Cronkite and Rather talk about all the negative things they could think of. I sat down in front of the news. My eyes were opened. Whose side are these news people on? Name's Larry Wayne Hertwig. And uh, I'm living at the North Dakota Veterans Home in Lisbon, North Dakota. I was in the Army for two years. I was put in the uh, Military Intelligence Department or section, received documents from confidential up to top secret. 
my job was to make sure that the information that got to the next department where I was was fairly safe. The only battle I was in was during Tet, and I was only on the front lines then for about a week, I think. And the sergeant that I worked for in intelligence came and got me and took me off the line. He said, you're needed more in the office than you are here, so. We got uh, debriefed when we got back. The stateside told us that we might have flashbacks, things like uh, when you're with your family, tell them if you're sleeping soundly especially, don't wake a person up by standing over the bed and shaking them because they'd more or less attack you. I think one time I did, my little brother was sent to wake me up. The only thing I remember was my dad was, when I woke up basically, fully woke up, dad was holding me and mom was holding my little brother and he was crying <laughs> because I dropped him and made him feel bad, scared. <laughs> That's the worst. My name is uh, Maury Schwinden, and I was in the uh, United States Army. I currently live in Fargo. During the, that era, I was uh, stationed on the island of Okinawa from uh, November of 66 through October of 68. And in that capacity, I was a first lieutenant, and my job was to escort classified documents in and around the island of Okinawa to the different military installations. And then sometimes we would also go off island. I made three trips into Vietnam. Most memorable is March of 1968, which was the Tet Offensive. While I was there, the helicopters started coming in. And basically what it was, is all medical uh, evacuations coming off the front line. And they were stacking them up in three piles, dead, nearly dead, and operable. When I was in the, in the campaign, obviously I was uh, taught the military uh, philosophy, shall we say. But after I got back and started reading what was happening there and the, uh, some of the political things that were going on, to me it was one big wasted experiment by the military and the politicians that they brainwashed. There was nothing accomplished there. We lost, what, 50,000 troops, two of them, which were my personal friends through ROTC. On Okinawa, we used to see the medevacs come in, the Marines, and uh, they were sent back to Okinawa for rehabbing before they went to the States. And you see these guys shot up, mangled, and for what? And uh, interesting enough, about 10 or 15 years after the war, I turned on the news one night, on the national news, and on that sequence was a clip of Secretary of State McNamara shaking hands with the Prime Minister of North Vietnam. And basically what they said and agreed to that the Gulf of Tonkin never happened. So here we have our fearless leaders telling us that we were brainwashed into this war by a fictitious event. My name is Willie Bitts and my rank and service is uh, E4. I was in the United States Army with the Combat Engineer Division and I live in Napoleon, North Dakota. 2nd of January, I was off and into the Army. And then off to Vietnam in May of 1968. We were in the front lines right off to get go. We, we were taking turns. The first six months was clearing landmines on a highway for 13 miles. So it was every day we had to use a mine detector to look for booby traps. We got our share of uh, leg work, put it that way, walking and, and uh, crawling in rice paddies, hiding, trying to duck, get out of the line of fire, hide behind rice paddy dikes. Our feeling was that 
we didn't think we were going to go back home. So we weren't afraid because we didn't think we were going to go home. So just when's my time up? And so we were prepared to die and uh, we knew it was going to be. We just didn't know when because we had talked about it many nights sitting at the, sitting around and, and uh, we didn't think we were going to go home. So that kept, I think that's what kept us going. We, instead of moping and, and uh, complaining about this or that, we just had to live with it and do our best, do what we were told. And, and that's what we were told. You do what we tell you, you'll survive. You know. We did our best, but we didn't believe we were going to go home. I would have talked to somebody, nobody asked. 16 brothers and sisters or 15 brothers and sisters, I don't think one of them asked. Funding for Prairie Memories, the Vietnam War Years, is provided by the following and by the members of Prairie Public.